how exciting it is. I mean, we were talking about the students and how excited we are to welcome, uh, hopefully, a new class. And here they are today. And thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, a lot to talk about. We have several questions, but we should just have this as a, as a conversation, a free-flowing conversation. So, Hiller, this is your first year at CIPA. Mm -hmm. So, so far, what have been your impressions? <laughs> That's what I was going to start by saying, is that I came to SEPA a year ago, um, January, so I was a new person uh, to both Columbia and to SEPA, and I have been just so impressed by the quality of the students, of the faculty, by the uh, seriousness of the scholarship uh, research teaching, uh, the sense uh, that there is a way to find a path for whatever you're interested in uh, at SIPA, which uh, was very impressive to me because there's such a, an openness. And I think with Karen as the dean, that openness um, has really been uh, made manifest to everybody. That if you, know, if you have an idea, we want to hear it. We want to understand what you want to work on. We want to try to make it possible for you to do that. Uh, the faculty has a broad and deep uh, level of expertise and experience uh, that we can make available to you. Uh, there's opportunities for cooperating with uh, you know, students and faculty from across the university. Um, so I have found it to be an incredibly rich, welcoming, uh, and uh, energizing place. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how you started, I mean, and the role of education uh, in all of this. I remember where I grew up, my, as I said, first generation, it was very clear for me, for my family, education is everything. And you also, um, as an undergrad in, in Wellesley, and then uh, you were extremely involved in issues around social justice, and then at Yale, obviously, a lot of work uh, on, with children's and on family rights and children's rights, and then into public service and, and all of this. So in what way you would, um, if you can talk a little bit more about the role in education, in your view, what is the power of education? How should the students think about this in the context of what they are, um, want, what they want to pursue at this moment in their career? Well, I mean, each of you has your own story. And um, as Karen said, you know, for me, uh, education was paramount uh, in my family. Um, my father had gone to college but he went on a football scholarship that was not open to me. Um, so my mother hadn't gone to college. And so for her, uh, it became a sort of singular um, hope and mission uh, to help um, her children, myself, my two younger brothers, um, understand the importance of education. And I was very lucky to have uh, an excellent public school education uh, where I grew up outside of Chicago. Okay. And then I went to Wellesley College, which is an all-woman's college outside of Boston, and again had uh, just a, an incredibly rich and uh, rewarding um, time there with excellent professors who really uh, cared about us, invested in us, and then I went to Yale Law School uh, and had uh, another um, challenging and rewarding experience there and then began originally as a uh, young lawyer working for the Children's Defense Fund, uh, started by another Yale Law School graduate named Marion Wright Edelman, an African-American lawyer who became one of my mentors um, in work and life. And I, I've always thought, and certainly have told young people, I mean, an education is one of the best insurance policies you can have, because you don't know what's going to happen in your life. You can make every preparation that you can imagine, and you will not have imagined everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and new opportunities are available. And so having a very solid uh, education, and then as you go through your education at the stage you are now thinking of coming to SEPA, 
you know, following your interests, your passions, mm -hmm. uh, going as deep and far as you possibly can in learning whatever is of interest uh, mm -hmm. to you. Um, for me, I've always felt that uh, it was essential to mm -hmm. invest in education, uh, try to provide as much opportunity as possible for mm -hmm. every young person to live up to his or her potential. Uh, and it's a real privilege to even be thinking about coming to a place like SEPA. I mean, yeah. it's really, it's a, it's a privilege that um, you've been offered and you are now thinking about whether or not to accept. Um, but it is something that I hope you highly value. We all hope you come here, obviously. Um, but it's in and of itself such a gift that is just not available uh, in, to most people in the world today, most young people. Um, and then the final thing, I heard what Karen was saying in her introductory remarks, and uh, we, we are facing such complicated problems, and some of them require um, scientific solutions, economic solutions, obviously political solutions that rely on good policy and people who know how to uh, get it implemented. So the work is as important, if not more important, than it's ever been. And therefore, mm -hmm. your thinking about going into um, policy um, and public affairs gives you an opportunity to really challenge yourself about what you believe try to become even more intellectually disciplined in how you analyze problems, uh, because it is through your education and your commitment to what that education represents to you that you can make a contribution. Uh, and the world needs that mm -hmm. so badly right now, because there's so much wrong information and so much manipulated information and so much just old-fashioned propaganda and so much ideology and all the rest of it, that trying to cut through that with evidence-based analysis mm -hmm. and recommendations is uh, sadly right now in short supply and we need a lot more of it and therefore wow. we need more people uh, to do what you're thinking about doing here at SEPA. Exactly. So one of the things that from early on, uh, when you and I first met, there were two things that uh, we wanted to do together as a first step, right? One is starting IGP, and we will talk about IGP and what they can expect and how they can be involved, because I, I, this, we've done this also for the students to be engaged with what we do. And the other thing is that um, from the very first conversation, I'm a scholar of international uh, relations or foreign policy, and you as um, uh, Secretary of State, from the very beginning, we sense that there is a lot that we uh, can do together in a classroom uh, to bring the scholarly work and the literature on foreign policy together with the experience and expertise that you have from as a practitioner. Um, so this is why we decided to teach the Inside the Situation Room. This was uh, 375 students that we had this fall, and we're going to offer it again next fall. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the class, what the students can expect, mm -hmm. and from your perspective, uh, how it's been? Well, I hadn't been in a classroom for a really long time. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you couldn't tell. Yeah, That's before. The <laughs> before I think everybody in this room was born looking around. Um, I taught in the law school at the University of Arkansas um, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I uh, uh, moved after uh, law school and after I worked on the impeachment inquiry of uh, Richard Nixon. Um, so I taught uh, law, which was um, a very uh, fulfilling experience, but I had not taught in a long time. So. When Karen and I first began to talk about the class uh, inside the Situation Room, we wanted to figure out the best way to expose our students to both the academic literature, uh, the expertise that Karen brings through her scholarship, through her writing, 
um, with the firsthand experience sort of practical approach that I bring because of the work that I've done. And we found it actually goes really well together um, because a lot of what um, she was teaching about what are the biases that people bring to decision making? How do you unpack them in yourself and in others around you? Uh, it's so important because I would sit in the situation room as Secretary of State and somebody would come with a, a comment or a question and you'd want to know what prompted that? Where did that come from? Why were they taking that perspective? And it would be related to an experience they'd had um, in the military, in the intelligence services, in the diplomatic corps. And so trying to figure out what is it that influences decision makers? How do you both uh, understand it and guard against it, take advantage of it where appropriate? Uh, and the work of you know, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize uh, winning uh, economist who just passed away last week, was particularly influential in helping us to understand what are the shortcuts people take? How do you go from what you are confronted with, um, either a, an actual full-blown decision or a piece of information, uh, to begin analyzing it. And everybody uses shortcuts. They're called heuristics, how you leap to whatever it is that you think it says. But how do you make sure that you're not wrong? How do you make sure that your shortcut hasn't been a detour um, or a jump to a conclusion that is not warranted? And part of what we want to do in this class is to really challenge um, our students. And as Karen said, it was an incredible class, 375, biggest you know, lecture room uh, at SEPA, and it was some undergraduates, um, and it was mostly graduate students and mostly from SEPA, but the students had to apply because the, you know, the, the demand for um, entrance into the class was very high, and so we had a chance to look at those applications and to assess people's writing and assess why people wanted to be in the class. And the other thing we did, which was very important uh, to me, is at the end of every class, we set, it's a 90 minute class, at the end of every class we set 20 minutes aside so students could ask us questions, because in a big lecture it's, it's challenging to do that, and students would line up and ask us questions for as long as we, we had to vacate the classroom for the next big class, but we would stay as long as we could. And the questions themselves were really um, fascinating, and the, the way that the students approached both the uh, the curriculum that was being taught in each class based on their own experience was in itself uh, a, a teachable moment. Uh, and I think it was for all the students who were there because students would stand up and we had Maria Ressa, who I think you're going to be meeting uh, later, um, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, the journalist from the Philippines who has joined the SEPA faculty and and she came and did a class on mis- and disinformation because it's something she has been not only studying but subjected to and even charged with crimes uh, because of her journalism, trying to get facts out about the prior government in the Philippines. And so when we got to questions, several of the students said, I want to be a journalist. You know, I, I came to learn about policy, but I want to be a reporter. I want to write, but I come from a country where journalists are killed. Um, and it, you know, it's a very stark moment when you see a, a, a classmate standing up there saying, I want to be a journalist, and in the country where I come from, we have the highest rate of killing journalists of any place in the world. Um, or when we had, a, we had a class on, you know, the role of women in uh, crisis decision making and getting more, you know, women's voices around the table and in peace negotiations, uh, because we now know, based on the available evidence, that you know, having women involved in peace negotiations actually increases the chances that they will hold uh, for a longer period of time because you've gotten into communities. You're not just top down declaring peace and walking away. Um, so there was just an enormous amount of richness in uh, the students. And it wasn't just, you know, in class at that point, obviously the sections that they attend every week in addition to the lecture class, but also stopping to talk to me or going to see you know, Karen or bringing an idea uh, to us. It was an amazingly um, you know, very rewarding experience. Uh, 
I really enjoyed it. Uh, we actually took so much out of it that we're now working on a book that brings really the scholarship uh, on crisis decision making and foreign policy together with the point of view of the practitioners because this is, this is the idea about how we challenge as communities. We challenge one another. Uh, the policymakers will come and say, this is what we don't know and we need more, <laughs> more knowledge, more scholarship on this. And this is where the, academ the academics will come to the policymakers and say, here's what we found and this is what we know and this is how it can be useful to you if we translate it the right way, if we make our work accessible to policymakers, and that's what we're teaching uh, the students, how to really bring and, and, and the work from the academy to policymakers and vice versa. So how many of you are interested in foreign policy and diplomacy? Okay. So Hillary, let me ask you this. As somebody who's been in the Situation Room, thought a lot, done a lot in terms of diplomacy. What, and we're looking around and the global challenges uh, that we're facing, um, geopolitics and, and, and other kinds, what role diplomacy plays in your view in trying to solve some of the issues that we're facing? I mean, diplomacy is the um, way in which people connect and relate to each other and try to find some uh, opening to, uh, build relationships, to solve problems, resolve conflict. Uh, and it is a, uh, it is a learned uh, art. Uh, people can, you know, be exposed to the writings and go in prepared, but it takes that kind of day-by-day -day experience of finding yourself in different situations and understanding how to apply uh, the literature, the you know the the very good insights, psychological and economic and historical, that are uh, going to guide you in your dealings with people. And I think it's about relationship building, uh, and it is about trying to find openings. Uh, you know, diplomacy sometimes gets a bad name because it's really um, painstaking and it can be very slow. Uh, I used to, uh, you know, kid uh, Henry Kissinger that he could never have snuck into China in an age of uh, ubiquitous cell phones. You know, there were no way that he could have gotten, you know, gotten there, done the negotiations uh, without anybody even knowing he'd been there. Um, so you have to understand what it takes to be a good diplomat in the time and place you serve. You have different sorts of pressures if you're in an adversarial uh, setting as opposed to a largely friendly one, even though you might have different interests. Um, and, and one of the main points that we tried to make in the class all the time is how to model responsible analysis and decision making. And it's hard because sometimes you're sitting down with people who you really don't like, don't trust, don't believe, and you got to figure out how to overcome your own uh, attitudes in order to do the job that you're there to do. Um, and, so, and, and it also be, can be coming from the other side of the table. They see you coming from whatever country or organization uh, that you are representing and have the same feeling about you trying to build some small fragmentary trust on which you can begin to talk about a decision that you're seeking to try to effectuate uh, really calls on a broad range of diplomatic skills, meaning not just your intellectual skills, but your emotional skills, uh, to be able to read a room, to be able to read the person across the table uh, from you. Um, and that's partly why in this time at SEPA, and particularly in our class, you want to test yourself. I mean, if you, if you leave with the same ideas and beliefs you came in, you, you probably didn't get the most out of your experience. I mean, part of what is challenging today in education, particularly higher education, is the recognition that sometimes discomfort is a sign that you are growing. 
and you cannot retreat from that discomfort if you want to continue to grow. And a lot of students are quite concerned about that because discomfort comes from being challenged. It comes from being presented with something that maybe you've never thought of before or you've thought of and rejected, but now it's coming at you from a classmate, a professor, and, and it's, it's uncomfortable and you wish it wouldn't be there and it makes you feel somewhat uneasy. And it's frankly in those moments that a lot of growth takes place. Not talking about being unsafe or feeling, you know, very isolated, but living with that level of discomfort that comes from being challenged is part of what this experience um, should provide. Yeah, and, I, and in the class, um, and it's not just in our class, but in a lot of the classes that you will take at SIPA, uh, we will teach you how to analyze a problem from multiple perspectives. And through this, to how to develop what we call empathic capacity. And empathy is not sympathy, but it's the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others and to see the situation from their perspective. Because in all this kind of, you know, at the, the end of the day, if you want to reach a solution, if you want to, if whatever it is, uh, a compromise um, or, or move forward, you have to feel very comfortable putting yourself in the shoes of others, understand how they are viewing the situation, and so you can come up with uh, points of view of, or, of solutions or arguments or whatever it is, um, understanding um, how to get to the other side. And that is something that requires a lot of, it's hard, you know, cognitively, it's very, very difficult to do. But as the secretary said, what we do is in the class and through the discussion and through the readings, we challenge you. We intentionally make you feel uncomfortable so you can start challenging your own assumptions so you can more easily look at the situation from different perspectives and, and, and see what you come up with. And so that's another. So, so in your interaction with our SIPA students uh, in Q&As, but also in you know, through IGP and other, um, what would you say is unique to the SIPA uh, student community that this group should know? Well, it's so, um, it, it's so international. It's so uh, representative of the world uh, that we find ourselves in right now, which is one of the real advantages of coming to SIPA because you don't have to go far to find somebody who does have a different set of experience, life experiences, uh, than you do. And to you know, make those connections and spend time uh, with one another you know, it's often said you learn as much from your fellow students as you do from yeah. your professors, and I think that's especially true uh, here at SIPA. I think it's also the case that, um, you know, the students that we have gotten mm -hmm. to know, um, especially through uh, IGP, the Institute of Global Politics, are students who have very clear ideas about what they are trying to accomplish. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not open to learning from, you know, new perspectives, but they have a sense of where they want to end up mm -hmm. and what they want to work on. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had, we have IGP student scholars. We have about 35 mm -hmm. of them, I think. Yeah. Um, and I remember when we had lunch with them and they were all going around talking about what they wanted to do. I was partic particularly struck by one young man, probably late 20s, I think, um, who had been in the United States military and he'd been assigned to work in, uh, you know, cybersecurity. And he worked there for a few years and then when he came out, he went to Capitol Hill to work um, mm -hmm. in the Congress. And he said, you know, one of the things that struck him was there just weren't very many people in the Congress, um, certainly not many members of Congress, but even in the staff, who knew much about cybersecurity. And you think about all the cyber attacks and all the mm -hmm. privacy issues mm -hmm. and the data uh, collection and everything that we yeah. live with when it comes to cybersecurity, and now facing artificial intelligence. And he said, you know, I came to SEPA because I really wanted to do some in-depth work uh, to better understand how I could make an impact through policy uh, where I could find, you know, a, a role that would enable me to share my expertise, but to help persuade and educate other people about what I knew 
I needed to understand how to make those connections and how to do the analysis that um, he would learn here. Mm -hmm. and, and I could tell you many stories like that because students literally from all over the world um, who have shared why they are here with us and what they hope to learn uh, from mm -hmm. uh, the whole SEPA experience. So I think that being a student here, it's like anything, it's like any experience in your life. You can make the most of it by really throwing yourself into it and really getting to know as many people as you can and spending time learning from them mm -hmm. as well as developing what your real uh, expertise will become. And I, I think that's a very exciting opportunity. I agree. And so one of the thing, one of the reasons we started IGP is because we looked around, as we said, there are significant challenges uh, that we are facing, and they're complex, and they intersect with one another in ways that um, not very easy to think about simple solutions. There's never really simple solutions. So, and we've taken up some of them uh, already this year. Can you talk a little bit or share with this group what are the significant policy challenges that you see um, that not just we're facing, but that we can maybe do something about them or should be thinking about? Well, we don't have enough time to talk <laughs> about everything that I think uh, we are facing and how difficult it is. But I think if you, if you zero in <clears throat> on what IGP has mm -hmm. been doing, and I'll give you an example just from last week, um, we had a series of panels about artificial intelligence, and we had practitioners from Microsoft and Google and uh, Meta, and we had researchers, uh, scholars, uh, not just from Columbia, but elsewhere. We had a representative from the European uh, Commission and the work that they've done trying to, they're the only place in the whole world that has legislated anything on technology. Um, starting with privacy, uh, and now they are struggling with AI, trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to get their arms around it. Um, and it was just the most impactful um, set of uh, encounters because each, each panelist had a different perspective. And we mm -hmm. ended with my interviewing Eric Schmidt, uh, the former uh, you know, chair of Google, who's now become quite obsessed about the dangers of artificial intelligence and has written uh, a book, uh, actually two, mm -hmm. talking about you know, what are the actual recommendations that we could translate into policy uh, to try to um, you know, rein in what is unfolding uh, mm -hmm. almost without um, any real understanding. And you know, I was at a different conference a few mm -hmm. months ago, and one of the major players in artificial intelligence said, you know, this is the first time um, we have been not just studying something like other scientists used mm -hmm. to do, uh, whether it was biology or astrophysics or chemistry. You were studying what was there, trying to understand it. We are making it up as we study it, and we have no idea where it's going. Mm -hmm. And so the challenges and legitimate concerns about AI, side by side with the uh, hoped for benefits, is going to be a huge uh, purpose of IGP, trying to bring people together, trying to make a contribution to the policy debates, trying to urge uh, policy action. Um, because we just know, left to its yeah. own, uh, in five years, we're going to look around and say, well, mm -hmm. wait a minute, wh how did we let this happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the role of AI in information warfare, in actual warfare, mm -hmm. uh, in the both disruption and undermining of you know, business models, what it's going to do to democracy. I mean, just take that one issue, which mm -hmm. may or may not be the issue you're interested in. It's going to cut through everything. Absolutely. If we're talking about how you make good evidence-based decisions, and you don't even know what the evidence is, and you can't rely on the information you're given, and there are not enough people around you, as this young man told us, mm -hmm. who can even understand what the red flags might mm -hmm. be, how do you make decisions? How do you make decisions in your own life? That's hard enough. 
But how do you make decisions on a broader scale, whether it's in a government or in a business or wherever it might be? So these are some of the cross-cutting challenges. You can take any crisis we have right now in the mm -hmm. world and go very deep in each one of them. And we want you to. We want yeah. you to understand the best you can. We want you to be able to argue all sides and then decide what you really believe and figure out how to uh, make a contribution. But there are cross-cutting challenges. Climate change is another one of those. Mm -hmm. You know, Energy usage and climate change, going to cut across everything. Uh, mass migration connected to climate change. It's another cross-cutting issue. I mean, you just can look at both the, you know, yeah. sort of the vertical and the horizontal mm -hmm. when you think about uh, what you want to study, what you want to learn, and how it's mm -hmm. all connected. Because as, you know, Karen said, it, it is all connected in one way or another. We live in an interconnected world, even though a lot of people would prefer not to live in an interconnected world. We live in one, yeah. and you have to figure out how to understand it and best as you can figure out how to, you know, intersect with it. Yeah, and then on top of this, we put the geopolitics uh, and how the crisis uh, and the wars and, and authoritarian actors and how they take advantage of the new technologies and, and the implications for democracies, especially as you will see next year, you'll come, this is an election year, right? Half of the world's population is voting next year. And so what one of the things we will do in IGP is monitor in real time what are the uh, what do we see uh, the role of AI in elections around the world? What do we learn? And then obviously we'll have a lot going on on the elections here in the United States. Do you want to say something about the election here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a lot to say about that also. Um, I'll save it for IGP. Um, but I think. Look, if half the world is voting, some of them in sham elections, like the one we just saw in Russia, for example, but others in very consequential elections. And you'll see uh, an election in June for members of the European Parliament. H how is that going to influence uh, European policy going forward? How are elections within Europe uh, being influenced and being uh, impacted by uh, disinformation campaigns. You'll see that in our election, it's already begun. Uh, we had uh, excellent, uh, you know, um, explanations of that at our uh, event last week where people who study the disinformation talked about some of the specific examples, yeah. one from Slovakia, uh, the recent election that was there. Uh, and, you know, one, a very primitive, uh, false audio allegedly of Joe Biden telling people uh, not to vote. Well, this is going to be on steroids in the fall, everywhere. And authoritarian leaders, authoritarian wannabes, political parties are all going to be trying to figure out how to manipulate your minds. Because uh, that's really what it comes down yeah. to. How to inject false information, how to mislead you, chase rabbits down, conspiracy, you know, uh, holes and figure out how to uh, get you either to refrain from voting because you're being fed information about specifics that uh, are troubling to you or even misled about an election or get you to vote uh, a certain way. All of this is going to be uh, part of our extra mm -hmm. curriculum uh, through IGP because this is one of the most critical issues we're going to be facing. How do you run elections when you can't tell what the truth is, you yeah. know? Yeah. Or even figure out if somebody said what they allegedly said in the video you mm -hmm. just saw on TikTok. Is that the real person? Is that a really good deep fake? What is it? So how do you know what to even believe that can influence your, your vote or your participation? Um, so yeah, we have a lot to, it, to cover have, next fall. Yes, and I, I <laughs> and I highly recommend you watch the uh, the event we did last week on the threat of AI to the elections. And if you're not already anxious and depressed, this will definitely get you there. <laughs> and wait until you meet Maria Ressa. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's definitely uh, very important. Um, last. Two quick questions. One on, we t I talked a little bit about the, another exciting thing that we launched, which is the Women's Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you view the role of, of gender uh, equality in, in, in the world we're 
facing? Well, you know, um, this was this was something that obviously I was very interested in doing, Absolutely. but it really came from students. Um, one of the very first questions we were asked in our class, right. going back to the beginning of uh, the right. fall semester, was from a young woman who, you know, said, "I'm very interested in." Uh, you know, women's full participation, women's equality, women's power, are you gonna be covering that? And we said yes, and then she said, well, what are you gonna be doing about it? And we said, well, we're gonna have a women's initiative, and that's what we decided to do. And this initiative is focused on uh, the broader questions about women's inclusion in uh, government, policy-making, political activity, uh, and there is a very clear pushback going on to the advances that women have made over the last, yeah. you know, 50 years. Um, and it's a pushback driven largely by authoritarian uh, strong men uh, mm -hmm. who have, you know, really latched on uh, the uh, use of uh, stereotypes and caricatures of women uh, in order to uh, sort of align themselves with a more reactionary approach to governance. Uh, so you'll hear, you know, Xi Jinping in China say women should go back to the home and start having babies because the disastrous policy, the one-child policy uh, of China has decimated their demographics. They're in terrible demographic trouble. So. Who's supposed to save the country? Women, who are not even present any longer in the governing bodies. Or in Russia, you know, led by a prime misogynist mm -hmm. who, you know, uses uh, sexist language, who encourages the Duma to repeal uh, laws that protected women from domestic violence, and on and on, uses rape as a tactic of war. Um, but even in this country, I mean, the rolling back of uh, you know, Roe v. Wade, the reversal by the Supreme Court, sending a very clear message that uh, you know, women were not to be trusted to make mm -hmm. our own decisions about the most uh, personal uh, choices. And in fact, those decisions would be made largely by uh, you know, state legislatures and then uh, depending upon the outcome of the election in mm -hmm. November, maybe by the Congress with you know, even more uh, repressive measures. And then you go from, from that to saying, well, we're gonna try to, you know, prevent you from uh, exercising your right to travel or your right to, you know, get uh, appropriate medical care in the middle of medical uh, crises. I mean, it just yeah. is all about controlling women and women's choices. And so the Women's Initiative looks at the political implications of that and is very clearly focused on women's economic opportunities, women's you know, uh, access to uh, the full range of health services, uh, women's safety because online yeah. attacks on women are out of control. The virulence, the threats, uh, if you are a woman in the public eye, obviously in politics and government, but it can be in entertainment, it can be in business, it can be anything. If you're a woman who pops your head up and takes a stand or speaks out or is pursuing a goal that is uh, you know, not typical for women, you will be attacked online and it will be virulent and violent uh, and it's something we take very seriously uh, as a problem because if you chill women's participation, and I talk to young women all the time who say, well, I was thinking about maybe running for office, but it's just so scary out there. And you know, I can't, I can't pretend to disagree with them. It is scary. Yeah. But you, know, you have to also take advantage of the opportunities uh, that might come your way. So all of this is part of the IGP broader uh, uh, mission to look at global politics, look from national to global and try to figure out how to uh, you know, make uh, a strong argument for uh, the changes or protecting the changes uh, that uh, will enable you know, women to have the uh, most opportunities to pursue their own uh, mm -hmm. dreams. And I have to say, there was a young woman who stood up in our class, and this has stuck with yes. me, uh, in one of our classes, 
a young woman from China, and she said, I am here because my father let me live. Because under the one child policy, our first, the first child in the family was a girl, and my father did not want another girl, but he let me live, and I am here to show him that that was the right decision, to get the best education I can get, and to be the best daughter I can be, to make sure that he is always happy he made that decision. When you hear that kind of story, okay. and you think about the pressures that girls and women are under, and it's not just in some places, it's everywhere right now. You have to realize that if we don't keep fighting for you know, equality and opportunity, and if we don't have a lot of men uh, to be our allies, uh, it's like the canary in the coal mine. The air gets thinner and thinner as women are oppressed and people can get away with it. You never know who might be next. And so part of our emphasis on that is both on the substance, but also because look at history. It's uh, a pattern that we can't allow to be repeated. And uh, we are at time. So the last question, what advice do you have for this group who want to be, who will be, the next generation of policymakers? Well, first, come to SEPA. That's, uh, <laughs> that's easy. That's easy. <laughs> um, but you know, secondly, just building on what Karen and I have said, come to SEPA and immerse yourself in the experience. I mean, really immerse yourself in the scholarship, in the classroom, uh, in coming up with your own interests that you then can pursue in this amazing city where, as she said, there are internships and opportunities, and that's part of what the dean's office is for. If you yeah. think of something you want to work on or a place you want to go intern at or a place you want to collaborate with, come and see us, and we will do everything we can to try to make that possible. And we've had students who have come with really interesting ideas that we're still trying to work out, trying yeah. to figure out how to get into the curriculum, how to get mm -hmm. into uh, the IGP work, because uh, we want to be as responsive and open as possible. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm so happy to be here at SEPA, is because it is the least sort of bureaucratic <laughs> academic institution. And, that means that there's a lot of opportunity and space for each person to find your right spot that will give you the best possible um, you know, opportunity. And, and Karen mentioned the first woman who is the commissioner of the New York uh, Fire, Department. Fire Department and uh, Laura Cavanaugh, and just an amazing person who said, you know, she could never have gotten that position. She could have never done it. It's really hard. I mean, running a fire department as a woman where there's only like 1% women in the whole department. But part of the reason she got the job is she went to SEPA. Yeah. And so when the appointment came around, she'd been in the fire department, she'd been managing, she'd been uh, you know, proving her uh, ability to work within that system. And so you know, they took a chance on her. And it still is really hard. But she feels like this experience gave her the grounding she needed to deal with what are, you know, crises on a daily basis uh, just about. So I think if that's the kind of career you want, if that's the kind of uh, challenge you're willing to accept, uh, then this is the place for you because we can help to tailor opportunities that will enable you uh, to dive deep into whatever you're interested in, as well as get a really good, broad uh, base uh, of education and experience. Thank you so much, Secretary Clinton. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for all that you do. The students are very lucky to have you, and I hope you will have a chance, too. Thank you very much. Thank you.